Nuclear. It's another omnibus budget bill. They're calling it version 2.0. The latest move by the Conservatives to push more than 400 pages of stuff through Parliament in one bill. Critics call it an affront to democracy. Is it? Chantel is in Montreal tonight. Bruce is in Ottawa. Andrew is here in Toronto. An affront to democracy, Andrew? Is that what it is? Uh, it's a good turn for it, and it's the second one in the space of a year. And in some ways, it's not quite as far-ranging, it looks like, at first blush, as the first time, but it's worse because it's the second time around. So they took a what one would have hoped a, a bloody nose on it in the spring when the opposition raised a fuss. It doesn't seem to have deterred them at all. Look, you know, you're never going to vote on every single line item of a budget with a separate bill, but there's questions of degree, and when they push it this far, it makes it very difficult to know what Parliament intended. They're having to vote on all kinds of different matters at the same time. Essentially, they're bumbling up their, more or less, their entire fall agenda into one vote. Uh, this is not what Parliament is supposed to be about, and it's really disturbing that they're coming back and doing it yet again. Chantal, are you seeing it that same way? Uh, yes, I am, uh, for the reasons that Andrew gave, but also because the only rationale that the government really puts forward to justify it is that they can do it. Uh, and they are uh, in a majority setting. Majority government gives the government immense powers and the last word at the end of the day. So this is overkill. But it's also uh, an affront to democracy because it, it, the, it fits a pattern of affronts to democracy, which include the demean question period where the government introduces fiction at every occasion and the disappearance, as we saw over the past few weeks, of any concept of ministerial responsibility. Are you going to join in on this uh, thumping they're taking on this, or are you going to uh, defend it? No, I, I think it's certainly an affront to democracy, Peter. I agree with what uh, Andrew and Chantal have said. And I think it's, it's a tricky issue politically for opposition parties because, on the one hand, it sounds to people, or it can sound just like a process issue, but, of course, there is some substance in this bill, the Navigable Waters Act or the Navigation Act that uh, uh, was spoken about earlier in the program is, is an important piece of substance. But more, I think, important than anything else, it speaks to an attitude that um, voters need to be concerned about, I think, increasingly. Because if governments believe that they can get away with this, this is a very provocative act. And I think, unlike some of the situations in the past, as Chantal indicated, there's really no justification offered here. There's no fiscal cliff. There's no jobs crisis. Stock markets aren't collapsing. Socialists and separatists aren't about to take over. So you have to look at it and wonder if it's going to start to look like arrogance to voters at some point. Well, you wonder, given all that, why, why they would go ahead and do this anyway. I mean, they did, as Andrew mentioned earlier, take quite a beating, uh, not only in the media, but uh, on the part of a lot of Canadians who were quite upset uh, in the spring when this went last time. Why do you think they went at it again? Andrew? Because they didn't pay enough of a price. Uh, they, the opposition has relatively few tools now because of past episodes in which opposition powers to, to hold up legislation has been stripped of them. So one thing leads to another. Each time Parliament or the opposition loses ancient prerogatives, it becomes that much easier uh, to, produce, to push forward more such abuses. And indeed, the, 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 the text of the bill itself starts taking more and more uh, matters that used to be matters of legislation become matters of ministerial discretion. All these things compound on themselves. So the opposition has relatively few tools, and the public has shown, unfortunately, that they don't care enough until it really becomes a crisis. Let us, none of us, fall into that ancient journalistic cliche of just talking about this as if it was a quote-unquote process issue. Democracy is a process issue, yes, and it's just as important as the text and the substance of the bill. Well, let's stay on the theme of democracy here for a minute and, and, and tell me whether there is a link between an omnibus bill like this and what we witnessed in Ontario this week with the shutting down of the legislature. We're seeing a similar situation in B.C. where it's been, what, five, six months since uh, Premier Christy Clark uh, has had the legislature open and it could be another five or six months before she does. Is there a link between these kind of stories, Chantal? Yes, uh, and the link is uh, an increasing disregard for uh, legislature, for the legislative bodies that uh, people elect, not only uh, to just sit there at the whim of a government, but also to scrutinize laws, to hold debates. So it's become that when, when, when the going gets hot, uh, as in BC, in the lead up to an election that is going to be difficult, as in Ontario, where the government is in a minority and on the edge of many crises, you just pull the plug on Parliament. And what it also shows, and that is why that omnibus bill is dangerous, is that every precedent gets built on in the sense of less 
democracy and less accountability. So you get serial prorogations on Parliament Hill, and then you start getting them for the same kind of reasons in the provinces. Bruce? Well, certainly there's a link, and I think the link is in the area that Andrew and Chantal have talked about. It, it, I focus particularly on, well, sure, it's easy to focus on the, on, the, uh, on the political principles and say they're to blame for the decisions that they've taken that fall into this pattern. That's very important. But the, the, the real question in my mind is, will enough voters care at some point about these abuses uh, to exact a price? Because if voters don't exact a price from politicians who behave in this fashion, uh, they can't really expect that behavior to change in the future. That's what needs to happen, not just the, uh, uh, the approbation of uh, people about these decisions, but voters need to get more energized. But Peter, when people have care, then they've believed the parties that said we will change the ways and we will do better, as the Conservatives did promise in opposition, and then elect them, and they do more of the same and worse. How do you believe that people are going to think that they can affect change by voting for another party? Uh, you know, or, yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Well, I was just going to say, you know, when reporters write about some tin pot le legislature in a third world dictatorship, they're careful to say it's a largely ceremonial legislature. We have increasingly a largely ceremonial parliament. It doesn't really do any of the things it's supposed to be doing in the way that it's supposed to do it. If, you, if when you have votes, I mean, they're largely meaningless anyway they're, they're because they're so strictly whipped, but even to the extent that they have meaning, if you just substitute omnibus bills for voting on separate legislation, what does voting in the legislature really mean at that point? If you can't really have uh, uh, the kind of parliamentary scrutiny of the executive, again, parliament doesn't do a great job of that at the best of times, but if when they finally are holding government's feet to its fire, to the fire, it can just prorogue to get out of trouble, what does that mean? What do debates mean if the government, whenever it feels like the debate is causing any discomfort, can invoke closure? We have a crisis of our parliamentary democracy here. It gets worse with each passing year, but it's one of those sort of slow motion things where unless you have some absolute bust up, nobody seems to notice. All right, mm -hmm. let, me, uh, let me be a, a little provocative here with, uh, by throwing this one on the table. I mean, first of all, shutting down uh, the legislative body, pro prorogation, uh, you know, is a legitimate tool in, you know, in the toolbox uh, of governments, and we've seen it used many times over, uh, over the years. But these past few years, um, it's been used in a way, both provincially and federally, and now the omnibus bill as well, closure. Some people are pointing back to that attempt, or uh, by that request from Stephen Harper to uh, Michael Jean, the Governor General in 2008 to prorogue Parliament just after it had, uh, had, had taken session, uh, as the beginning of this, that in some way that, that's the real legacy of Mikhail Jean, that that moment brought us on a long, slippery slope to this one. Who wants to tackle that one? Bruce? Well, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's clear that her decision uh, offered, if you like, offered uh, Mr. McGinty something of a fig leaf. Uh, uh, in the sense that this was done before, it wasn't the first time, but he's still mostly bare, and that's not a very pleasant sight for voters. I, I think at the end of the day, uh, it is important that voters not look for other process decisions to justify what has happened, but instead say, there is a cumulative effect here. We need to put an end to it. Andrew. I don't think it started there. I think, I, I, I may be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure Jean Chrétien invoked closure, invoked, uh, should say, mm -hmm. prorogation to put off an auditor general's report he didn't want to see. It was certainly worse the, 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 to, to avoid a confidence vote, which was what uh, Harper did. I don't fault Michel Jean for that. I think she gave the right answer to a question that shouldn't have been put to her. But so long as the first minister still enjoys the confidence of the House that because there hasn't been a vote yet, I think she's pretty much bound to, uh, to follow his advice. I think if we want to change the, some of these conventions, if we want to you know, take away from the, the, the Prime Minister the power to invoke closure or to invoke uh, prorogation or to dissolve the House or all these things unilaterally, we have to, that, has, that change has to come in Parliament. It has to be either legislation or, or changing the, the role of the Governor General. I don't think we can ask the Governor General to sort of freelance on that. Chantal? No, I totally agree with, with all those points, uh, and I can't see the change will come uh, from the inside because there doesn't seem to be much political will to affect it. It's a useful tool for, for prime, prime ministers and premiers, but surely you're not asking the governor general and the lieutenant governors to be the arbiters of our, our body politics. I wasn't asking. I was just like throwing an idea out there, and it got no. hammered. <laughs> no legacy. <laughs> okay. Um, the other half of the week's story here in Ontario is uh, McGinty's departure, and 
the, some of the discussion that has surrounded that departure suggesting that this is a, a this is a person who could end up running for the federal liberal leadership and I wanted to know what any of you thought on that seeing as there's only been one premier in 116 years has ever been uh, uh, ended up as a prime minister most of them don't make it in any way and no matter how good they may have been uh, does McGinty head to the federal scene who wants the first run at this Chantal well, I don't know if he does head to the federal scene, but we wouldn't be discussing it if he bolted the door to it on Monday night, and <laughs> certainly yeah. he knew how to do it. Um, for a, from a journalistic point of view, frankly, if he wants to, to do it, we will all be uh, better served by a better debate in the liberal leadership. Uh, the liberals would be better served with a competitive campaign, and so would Justin Trudeau. Now, whether Mr. McGinty wants to chance it and whether he could beat Justin Trudeau, I don't know, but he certainly would be uh, a serious candidate. Bruce? Well, I don't think he will uh, run for the federal liberal leadership, although he might. I, I don't think he will because I think he really has been beaten up pretty badly, and uh, it's probably convenient for him to have people talking about this rather than talking about uh, the cumulative problems that were visiting uh, his doorstep in the last little while and the, and the challenges he was going to face if he stayed on. Um, I think that if he did enter the race, he would be a credible candidate, but a wounded candidate uh, because of all of the problems that he's encountered over the last several years. Um, and if he did win that leadership, uh, if, he, if he overcame the odds that uh, seem to be favoring Mr. Trudeau right now, uh, I'm not sure if that would be a good thing for the party because he certainly travels, I, I think he would campaign with about as much baggage uh, as the Queen uh, uh, Elizabeth travels with these days. A lot, of, uh, a lot of things that he would be answering for on the campaign trail. Jeez. Taking shots at everybody here tonight. Andrew. I think it's a fantasy of the Toronto media, frankly. Uh, I don't think he will run. I certainly don't think he should. I think it's very, very much in question whether he could win. And if he did win, I think he'd lead the party to a very bad place. Uh, this is not a fellow at the top of his game. He's essentially being, you know, helicoptered off the roof of the legislature in, in, in uh, Toronto. Uh, he's run an unusually cynical and calculating government from the beginning when he when he reneged on his promise not to raise taxes without a referendum having won election on that promise to his last act of, of you know quitting the, the the leadership and then shutting the the legislature for an indefinite period of time okay. i don't think it would serve anybody's interests all right good discussion on a lot of a uh, lot of fronts you guys really are warmed up look forward to seeing you back in the studio next week andrew here in toronto chantelle's in montreal bruce in ottawa